Well, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm with probably the oldest friend. If you were to look at people that I become friends with over the years, I don't think I've been friends with anybody longer than I have with you, man. We met no. when we were 12 years old. Yeah, sixth grade. And it's kind of cool. We've got a really special group of friends I'm always bragging on, and you are an exceptional person. You're now a plastic surgeon, which is <laughs> kind of fitting, I guess. I from know, our, there's from, there's from, a lot of people that would have never thought that. <laughs> well, it's funny because me and you actually both signed up for real estate school at the same time. Yeah. And I decided to pursue that, and you decided instead to go to medical school for the next 15 years. But Yeah. Uh, well, I did we, real estate all through undergrad. Yeah, I, I hated it. <laughs> I hated it. So my my dad uh, is a pretty successful commercial realtor. I would say very um, successful commercial. Has has a small uh, family owned business, and I'm the oldest of four sons. That was always the plan: was the oldest son taking over the family business. And when I uh, said I'm going to medical school, he looked at me and said, "You're an idiot, and I'm not paying for that." <laughs> I said, okay. Well, one thing I've always appreciated about you is you've always kind of done what you wanted to. And you had a lot of pressure to go into that. Um, but you just always want to do your own thing and carve your own path. And frankly, in a lot of ways, your dad, I mean, there was, there's been a, it's been a very difficult road to get where you are now. Now you're, you know, very successful plastic surgeon. It's kind of awesome. But the path to get here uh, was anything but easy. I mean, how many years of school and between school and residency did it take to finally be full time as a plastic surgeon? Oh man! So um, I did a year of school before um, doing a mission, um, and then I did an LDS mission for two years, um, and then I came back and did another three years of school, almost four. That was all undergrad up at the University of Utah, uh, and then four years of medical school down in Houston stayed there for a residency so for plastic surgery residency kind of the faster route if you're lucky is to get into what's called an integrated program you do six years after medical school that's so the fast route that's the fast route if you okay. don't get in that route it's eight ten years wow. um and so yeah 14 years total of school and uh training and now i'm back here i've been here uh, in practice in draper for a year well it's kind of funny because it's you know for me i always I I enjoyed the process of going to school, the idea of like meeting people and, you know, I mean, that's me and you met in elementary school, right? Yeah. I'm sitting at the school lunch table in sixth grade. Um, but for me, school was always more about that. And I think I found a perfect kind of career for me going into the real estate side. But for you, the real estate thing was just like, you, like as you said, you just really didn't really want to do that. And so for you, you found something that you're passionate about that you now get. And one of the cool things about your job, I think a lot of people think plastic surgeon, you're just doing boob jobs all day. But at the end of the day, I mean, you've shown me so many people who either had a cleft palate or they had something, they get in an accident. Um, and there's a lot of uh, fulfillment in being able to help these people because nothing will make you more insecure or more depressed than having something all of a sudden wrong with your look, right? Everywhere you go, people are staring and looking at you. Oh, for sure. Well, let me say this. There, There is kind of that kind of almost dichotomy split, I think, in society where society looks at plastic surgery and it's either cosmetic surgery, which is the bad plastic surgery or the vein plastic surgery, or it's the other side. It's the guys doing cleft lips and palates and mission trips. And those are the good plastic surgeons. <laughs> and, you know, I just I, I don't see it that way. I remember um, I was uh, going through training. I was in medical school and I had um, a like a high kind of church leader guy I looked up to that pulled me aside and said, what are you going to go into? And I said, well, I'm thinking about going into plastic surgery. And he says, oh, that is just so sad that <laughs> just so sad that the world has become what it is and medicine has become what it is, that that's what you have to do to make a living. And I was like, well, hold on. <laughs> I like it. That's what I want to do. And I, I look at the cosmetic side the same way as I look at, the other side, if somebody comes into my office and they don't feel good about their body yep. and they don't feel good about their breasts or their tummy or, or anything, the fact if they don't feel good about their nose, the fact that I can do something to make them feel a little bit better about themselves is huge. I mean, that's the best part about my job. And you can call it vain, but no, I, it, I, it makes that person feel so much better. It's 100% great. agree with you. And where my mind got changed, I dated a girl, you know, I actually got engaged to her 10 years ago mm -hmm. and she'd been married and I can't tell you how many insecurities she had. Her ex-husband had cheated on her and she thought the whole thing stemmed because she didn't have big boobs. Sure. And, you know, and she just, this literally drove her to a place of insecurity that frankly made it where I literally had to break up. I it just, she was so devastated over this, like 
idea that that was what had happened. And having been, you know, around in the dating scene for a long time now, I've met so many women that they do have these insecurities and, you know, they're the idea of somebody seeing them in a bathing suit because they had a baby or something, all these different things. And some people are totally okay with it, but other people, it really is an insecurity that causes them pain every single day. So the yeah. fact that you're able, whether it's a nose job, I mean, I have a friend that, you know, one of my close friends that she used to work for me and she got a nose job and it changed her whole life. And she's in a relationship that she, and she always, whether or not you, it's true or not, society does judge us based on kind of physical appearance, whether you're guy or girl. And so the fact that you guys, you know, it's like God made us all special, but he also definitely favored some with looks better than others. So Absolutely. if you can do something to weigh, tip the scale back in your favor, I'm a hundred percent on board with it. And I really like, that was when I totally encouraged you as dating that, you know, that woman, I really understood just how important your job is to help people get that security. Yeah. It's, I love it. I, you know, it's, I mean, I, I couldn't ask for a better profession. I mean, you, you, I know you love what you do. And it, I think that's what's inspiring to me is to see people that like really love what they do and it's a passion, it's a drive. I mean, that's what you gotta find. I mean, it's cliche to say, I mean, I love going to work every day, but it's get up and love it. I mean, yeah, if you find something you enjoy doing, you never have to go to work, right? Yeah, like, absolutely. Well, and so let's back up into your story. I mean, it's so, okay. um, again, uh, having been, when I mean, we literally best friends, been best friends since we were 12 years old. Um, and we, <laughs> we could tell a million stories, we probably shouldn't. <laughs> Nick was always the friend. Uh, let me just say this. You were always the guy you were honestly, when we were 12 years old, I mean, my family, we were poor growing up and your family, you know, had, wasn't necessarily in the same situation. And I remember though, well, like you poor growing up, you live three houses down from me. Uh, we were poor growing up. You're <laughs> three <to> houses down. <laughs> yeah. You're, well, the point of it is, is I got like a dollar 50 for lunch and by the time of lunch rolled around, I'd spent half of it on the vending machine. I was, but you were always know what I was getting at. Is like, you always were so welcoming to like, this is, you know, me and you became really close friends because you always had that spirit of giving. Every, every, I mean, last year you came to our sub for Santa auction party for OUR and you know, you ended up donating, I think like $10,000 for different items that you bid on. That's again, part of the reason why being a plastic surgeon is really cool. You're able to help other ways as well. But even when we were in sixth grade and I was, the little, you know, hustler kid trying to get a couple extra bucks for lunch. You let me carry your saxophone home from school every day and you'd give me like $2 for lunch for doing it. And I was so excited to, you know, and we were, you just were always welcome and doing that. That's one of the reasons why I've always tried to give back. And when, you know, when you were in medical school, I mean, you know, we did a couple trips where I was more than happy to pay for my portion of it while you're in school, because it just meant a lot to me always growing up. I mean, the value of having friends that were always there for you, not just monetarily. I mean, we were there for each other everywhere you could be, but yeah, but I think seeing the your, was that the right word? Your reciprocity, reciprocity. <laughs> sure. of that generation of, of that generosity has been, I mean, one of my one of the biggest examples in my life. And, and I think one of the reasons that I, I think I now look up to you more than, I mean, just about anybody. Just, I, I think that you have taken those lessons that you learned as having to rely on others to be a person that others rely on. And I think it's great. It's inspiring. Well, I think there is something to like letting people help you when you need it. Like I didn't need help. Like you said, we weren't like living in the streets, but honestly we, I mean, it was like every dollar mattered. There was days you open your lunch and it's two pieces of bread with mayonnaise and cheese. And I learned to hustle, become friends, do whatever I needed to do to get half the burrito from the other guy, you know? <laughs> and I, I love that. I love that about my story, but you were always were willing to just open your doors and do those things. But I mean, we graduate again, we get home from missions. You start in medical school and uh, you got married pretty quick. We always knew you were going to get married fast. You, <laughs> Nick wasn't one to worst stay single ever. very worst, long. Worst bet ever. <laughs> worst bet don't, ever. Don't you remember that? I came home from a mission and said, Did you bet me that I'd be married? You and I you know? made a bet. I, there, I was <laughs> I confident. I need to cash in on this bet. Yeah, I was confident there was no way I was going to get married before you. Like <laughs> well, you know, you beat me by later. about 15 years, but that's okay. Uh, yeah, that was a bad bet. Anybody would have. Yeah be losing that best. So no, um, but you got married and you went to medical school and I want to, you to kind of tell people what is a day in a, like, cause people see, I want to be a plastic surgeon. Sure. It's a very cool career. You know, you get to do a lot of, there's a lot of perks to being a plastic surgeon, but what I want to talk a little bit more about the struggle. Like what was your daily life was like as you're going through medical school and then into your residency? Yeah. I, I think the whole process is like one of just continuous, like more and more work gets loaded onto you until they're just, you can't go anymore. Um, medical school is 
Honestly, not terrible. I think medical school, I kind of treated like a job. Um, and I would get up and I would go and I would study and classes would get over at like noon, but I was like, okay, no, this is my job. I now go to the library and I now study. And then I would come home at five or six and medical school was very structured. Um, it was a challenge cause it's the first time, especially you, you kind of grow up as a smart kid feeling like school's pretty easy. Um, and medical school is the first time when you get into something, at least for me, it was where, all of a sudden I'm looking at all of this information, like there is no way I could sit here and read this and study this for 24 hours and I would still have no idea or not feel at all like I knew what was going on. And so that was a challenge to learn how to study, to learn what were the important things, what were the pearls that you had to pick out, like, okay, this is going to be really important to know and this stuff is important but not that important for this test. And so medical school was really learning how to, uh, how to study. And then I think once you finish medical school, you go into residency and residency is just a whole nother game. I mean, residency is a job. You're now an actual doctor. And um, for those that aren't as familiar, residency, you're, uh, you're basically working without pay. <laughs> yeah, so, so when you become a resident, you're, you're a doctor and you go into your first year, which is called your intern year. And so you hear people talking about their internships. And then after that, the rest of it's you're termed a resident instead of an intern. Um, and the pay depends on kind of where you live and what the resident is, but the government funds um, residencies across the country. And if you look at it as an hourly wage, most residents make less than minimum wage. Um, there's been r rules and regulations in the years where, you know, right when I started residency, they had just passed a law around the country that you couldn't work as a resident more than 80 hours a week. Um, and so we had to start documenting. I like how they hours. set a law. You can't work more than 80 hours a week. Yeah, like, <laughs> like that's a reasonable number anyways. <laughs> well, you know? I mean, you know, residents used to just, you were on call every other day and you would be at the hospital for 36 plus hours working around the clock. And, you know, people started to notice, well, I mean, that's hard. Residents are tired. Mistakes are being made. We're going to make this rule. Mm. But what was interesting is that rule has kind of backfired in a lot of ways. Um, when you make a rule telling residents who are taking care of all of these patients that they have to go home, residents start to treat it kind of like shift work and you lose kind of that continuity of care of a patient. So if you're taking care of somebody who comes into the emergency room, they're really sick, they need to go to the operating room and you've been taking care of them from the moment they walked in the door and then all of a sudden you leave the operating room and you're like, well, my shift's over. This person's gonna come in and take over and they know nothing about the patient, what's going on mistakes happen there too. Mm. So it's kind of a two edged sword and the 80 hour work uh, week rule has had some, some backlash and there's been some people trying to push back against that a little bit. And I mean, in all honesty, like get really without sugarcoating it, what was your schedule in one week? What time, how many hours were you working during your residency? Um, I mean, I would say that we always said we worked 80, but there were a lot of times I was there more. Yeah, and so you're getting there at what five in the morning, four in the uh -huh. morning. As yeah, as an intern or a lower level resident, you're kind of in charge of getting a lot of the numbers on patients, so looking up their labs, looking up their vitals, how they did overnight. So, depending on you know, you rotate on different services. So like for a couple months, I might be on a vascular surgery service, and then a couple months I might be on um, a cardiothoracic surgery service, and those were the patients I took care of. And so you would come in at uh, you know three thirty, four o'clock in the morning, whatever it took to get all those numbers ready. The rest of the team shows up and go see all your patients and you got to be done seeing patients by about 6 37 o'clock because that's when the surgeries start and then you're uh, running surgery most of the day and then either in between cases or once the surgeries get over at five six o'clock at night then you got to go see the patients again who are still in the hospital make sure everybody's doing well everybody's got the orders put in that they need and it's a big system and you're a small part of the system um and it's exhausting and but i mean looking back it was just so and we'll get into a little bit a couple of the things that happened while you were in residency but um would you do it again like is, there's somebody listening to this right now that wants to be a doctor wants to be a plastic surgeon um looking back because it was i know how hard you were working and how many personal issues it caused for you i mean would you do it again me personally yeah uh, absolutely um Somebody else coming to me saying, hey, what do you think about this? <laughs> tell, him to, tell him to run. Yeah. Um, I actually had my brother actually was, one of my younger brothers was considering going into medical school. And I was kind of in the middle of residency when he asked. And I just said, look, this is my life, man. I'm 
at work all the time. I never see my family. I never see my kids. But I love it. And if that's for you, absolutely. So he's in law school now. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, I kind of, you know, it's the same thing with like, I look back on my real estate career, how I built it. Because I worked 60, 70 hour weeks quite a bit mm -hmm. for a couple of years there. Not Never 80, no way. But um, 60, 70 was legitimate. And, you know, looking back, I'm glad I did it. But I, and I, I'm like, I would probably even do it again, knowing now, like what it's created for me. But I don't think I'd tell other people that necessarily to go the same route, you know, Absolutely. I wouldn't want to do it over again. I'll say that, but, <laughs> no, so it, sure. but there is an honor into like going to work and getting that, you know, that, that much, um, especially where you enjoyed it, but there's an honor in working that hard to work towards something. And it's kind of nice to know that our doctors work that hard to get good at what they're doing. Like anybody that's coming to you for plastic surgery is going to have the assurance of knowing that not only did you put in 14 years, but the amount of hours that you put in, you became an expert. If you go by the 10,000 hours rule, you became an expert after two, three years, <laughs> whereas any other profession, it would take you five to 10. Well, I definitely don't feel like an expert at times, but <laughs> I mean, it's it's constant work. I mean, you'll look around my desk, and I've got you know oral board exams that I'm currently studying for, and it's just it's nonstop. I'm on, just on, constantly on learning. Things. Plastic surgery is constantly changing, and techniques are constantly improving, and it's but yeah. that, that's why it's great. I don't know. Well, um, one of the things that happened when you were in your residency, I was uh, I flew out to Chicago one weekend, and when I landed, my mom, you know, had left me a couple messages, and so I called her right back, and she said, "Hey, Nick's been in a, a traffic accident." Um, and I don't, I think it's pretty serious. And so I didn't even leave the airport, jumped on a plane, headed to Houston and found out you'd been in a really bad accident. Tell us a little bit about kind of what happened and, and kind of what happened through that. Yeah. Um, so, uh, this happened in 2013. Um, and I was, you know, it was a regular work day. I was, you know, wasn't post call, hadn't been working around the clock and was on my way home. So, and I commuted. So my, uh, the hospital where I trained was on an island, it was on Galveston Island, just south of Texas, south of Houston. And I lived about 20 miles north of the hospital. So it took me about 30, 40 minutes to commute every day. Um, anyway, I was on my way uh, home from work, just tired. Um, was uh, about a, a regular 80 hour week. <laughs> yeah, a regular 80 hour week. Was, was tired, was about a mile from home. Um, and got to the section of road where the road kind of curves around to the right and I closed my eyes at the wrong time, um, hit another car coming at me head on, um, came to and we were kind of, uh, cars were kind of crunched next to each other so I couldn't get out the driver's side door and I heard this guy uh, screaming outside and airbags had gone off, there was smoke everywhere and things were a little bit of a haze. Um, but you, you kind of, at that point, I mean, I was a third year resident, so you're kind of ingrained to kind of switch into doctor mode and go mm -hmm. see what you can do. So I jumped over the middle console, got out of the car. Um, and as soon as I got out of the car, I just got really dizzy and just fell down in the middle of the road. Um, so laying down the road and I remember uh, calling my wife at the time and just really, she to this day will tell you like, she didn't think it was more than a fender bender because I was so calm. And I was just said, hey, that was in an accident. This is where I'm at. You need to come over here. Um, so anyway, she found a babysitter. She found a neighbor to watch the kids. And she came over. And I think by the time she got there, there were like 20 cop cars and a couple of fire trucks and ambulance. And she knew it was pretty serious. Um, and she came over. And I just I remember laying on my back in the road and... Um, and a uh, paramedic is standing over me. He's just asking me how I'm doing, how I'm feeling. And I'm just saying, just, I want to go home, take me home. Let me go home. And, you know, at that point he, he says, no, you, you can't go home. There's a fatality on the scene. Um, and you know, I was the only guy driving in, in my car. So I knew, uh, immediately that like, I think my whole life at that point, kind of flashed before my eyes and I thought, Oh my God, somebody's, somebody's dead. Um, and my medical career is over before it's even started and everything is, is over. Um, anyway, it turns out, uh, the car I hit, um, was, uh, driven by a 19 year old kid. Um, and he had just picked up dad from work 
um, kid uh, really hurt his hip and his ankle uh, and his leg pretty bad. Um, and dad was killed on impact. Um, so I got, uh, I got taken down to my hospital, um, by ambulance. Um, and I had a pretty bad, uh, fracture in my back in a couple of places. They thought I was going to be paralyzed, got a compression fractured. So I was in a brace for a little bit, some broken ribs, broken arm. Um, and being a trauma activation at the hospital where you train is kind of an experience because all of a sudden you you roll into the hospital and you've got all the residents who are your friends cutting off your clothes with trauma shears and running all these tests on you um and it's not a lot of fun but um you know that experience alone i um i think uh that experience alone really was obviously a life-changing event for me um and then over the course of the next year, I was in two more car accidents <laughs> um, and broke more levels of my back. Um, uh, but, you know, I I think um, the biggest thing that you learn from, from something like that is, is not to take anything for granted uh, and to appreciate the things that you do have. Um, and I, I just still remember you being there day after it happened um and you know had my mom and dad had flown in and um well. yeah no it's uh it's one of those things that you can't ever plan for right it's something that um but i mean i have so much um admiration for kind of how you handled it because you struggled with that obviously there was you know the fatality and everything else and then you got lawsuits on top of that that you now um were dealing with on top of everything else you were already handling what i mean how did you get through such a difficult time that's one of those things it's such a hard time in your life you're dealing with the physical pain the emotional pain um literally the loss of like being able to work at that time and do these other things so what i guess you know everybody in their life i think you know has different struggles and different trauma that they go through but what did, what was it that got you through in that time that was such a hard time in your life how did you manage the day-to-day -day? honestly for me it was it was work like put my head down and just worked, um, buried myself in kind of plastic surgery and training and trying to be the best plastic surgeon I could be. Um, I, you know, then, you know, family problems kind of mixed in because the, the story after this is about a year and a half after that accident, I got separated and ended up getting divorced. And my kids and my uh, ex-wife left Texas when I had about a year and a half left a residency. Um, and so all of that was just, you just put your head down, you work and look forward to a better time, I guess. Well, it's just, it's fun for me to see where you're at now because I think people see an end product. They see where you're at now and you've got so many things going right for you. Um, you know, and they're like, oh, that guy's a doctor, blah, blah, blah. You know, like they can kind of have that attitude. But I mean, I saw firsthand on a daily, weekly, whatever basis, like how much struggle and how much you had to go through in order to get where you are today. And I think that's one of the things that I love about people being able to tell their stories about the, you know, one of the reasons why I definitely want to have you on here because how you overcame that and how you kept fighting and going through that, you had a goal in mind, right? You knew what you wanted. Like you said, I just put my head down and went to work. Um, and I think that's like, you say it like, what else was I going to do? But in that situation, so many people, there's so many other things you could have done. You could have quit. You could have given up. You could have felt sorry for yourself and not, you know, wanted to do the things that got you to where you are today. But I think that the, you know, it's not getting knocked down, but it's how you react to that and how you get up afterwards. Yeah. I think, um, you know, and let me say, you know, and when I say that I put myself in the work and I buried myself in the work, that makes it seem like I was the one who got me through all of this. And I, I think the biggest, one of the biggest lessons that I learned from all of this is the there are people and your closest allies are the ones that really help you through those hardest times. Um, I remember my brother and his wife coming down a couple of times and I remember being just broke, like, you know, crushing medical school debt and no money and we didn't know what to do. And, um, I remember even my ex-wife who, you know, 
really she helped me finish those last that last year and a half and she helped put me in a position to be able to finish that last year and a half and I think you know I will always be grateful for her she got me through medical school and got me through most of that residency and you know despite the fact that we're not married I think that she is a huge uh factor to play in where I am at um and then you I mean I remember a conversation that you and I had where I had gone through all this stuff and car accidents, lawsuits and divorce. And I I was here in Utah, actually, and you had come over and I just was distraught. Like, what am I going to do? What do I do? And I remember you said, all right, just stop it. Here's what we're going to do. And you said, you, I think, canceled plans for the night and said, let's lay out the problems. What are the problems? And we laid out the problems and there were, I think, three or four big problems that were facing me. And we came up with a solution for every one of those problems. And I went home that week and carried out or started carrying out those solutions. And it made a huge difference. The last year of my kind of residency was so much easier and a relief because of some of the problems that you and I had taken care of together. Um, so I think it's, it's the people. And well, it was, I remember that conversation really well. It was funny because you didn't realize your situation and we do this as humans in your mind, you'd made it this monster that couldn't be defeated. It was so big. And what you didn't realize was you had a lot of equity in your house mm -hmm. and you didn't need to live in that house. And by selling the house, using the extra equity to pay other things that you needed to do, you were able to get other people out of your life you didn't want there at the time, just different things. And what I appreciated about that is you don't know how many times people have come to me for advice and we'll sit down and I'll give them like a couple things that they can do and they don't do it. And so when you actually, I mean, you did it, you did everything that we talked about and it was fun to see how that made a difference and helped you just feel a little bit less stress in your life. And I think that's, you know, one of the things like, I don't always have answers. Sometimes all a friend needs is for you to be there or listen or whatever else. And we've, you know, we've done that for each other as well. But I think in that moment, I just kind of felt like, okay, these are issues that I actually work in every day. I actually yeah. might be able to help him here. And that was fun to be able to, to Who knew I'd need a realtor. <laughs> Well, so fast forward, I mean, one of the things that, um, one of the things that's always been fun about you, Nick, is, uh, when we were growing up, me and the rest of it, we have a group of nine of us that are best friends. And to this day, we're a very tight group. And, um, except during wrestling season, except during the wrestling season, <laughs> because I would wrestle. I was the only one of the guys who wrestled. Yeah. Nick was only wrestler. The rest of us were like baseball players. But one thing I loved about you is you went out of your way to like learn about baseball. I remember one of the funniest things you ever did, but you hated <laughs> baseball. Let's just call it what it was. But you went out of your way to learn like all the favorite players on our teams, just so you could have well, conversations. Do you remember? Do you remember that night? Uh, no, I, I bought a Dodgers hat. Oh, yeah, I yeah. wanted to wear a Dodgers hat, <laughs> and I made you come over to my house, and we sat in my basement, and you made me memorize every position player because I knew that the second I wore that Dodgers hat at school, there were going to be first of all, all eight of our friends like you're a Dodgers fan now. Who was poop pitches for him? And I had no clue. And I, I learned that was the first time I ever heard of you did. Nomo. Well, my favorite thing we used to do is we used to go over to Nick's house, and his he had he was like the first guy that had a satellite dish. You remember that? And you had that. And, and it was disc. it was an hour earlier. Yeah, the only one that had a laser disc. <laughs> but your your whatever was on TV came on an hour earlier at your house because of the way yeah. it was set up with the satellite. So we would go to Nick's and watch Jeopardy. Oh, and then I'd go home to my house. And then like my Dale's, parents, Dale's still my, my parents to this day thought I was a genius. I think they're like, wow, you should watch my son play Jeopardy. It's like Groundhog Day. But uh, no, that was one of my favorite things we ever did. But it was so many good times. And one of the things that I remember the first time I ever kissed a girl was in your treehouse. We were like Lots 11 years old. Yeah. And we Lots were playing, we were playing spin the nutter butter. Cause we didn't have a bottle. We didn't have a bottle. So we played <laughs> spin the nutter butter. And I remember like that night, you know, like going home, just like feeling so, so these are like the kind of memories that like, this is how deep our friendship goes back. We used to toilet paper. I think your brother wanted to go toilet paper one time, but he was going to get in trouble. So we helped him toilet paper your own house or whatever. I, I don't know if I remember that. And I think I cleaned that up though. <laughs> Maybe you weren't there. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> And then there was like, Nick had like a super attractive older sister and you were a pretty good sport because we were pretty inappropriate all the time. But uh, it's just fun to like look back. I think one of the things that 
there's something about those years when you're growing up together. You're going through things together. Like both of our parents were kind of dealing with separation and divorce at the same time. And um, I think that's what creates those bonds, right? Like you're just there for each other. No matter what happens, I know if at any moment I need you, I can call you and you're there in my life. And um, I, I still remember, you know, like having you gone to – to medical school for 10 years. I mean, you were basically gone living in another city. Um, and you have to like find new friends and it's, I have so many amazing friends, but it's, you know, there's always something about those guys that you grew up with and went through those first things with, yeah. with each other. I'm jealous of all the other buddies. <laughs> well, I got some good other buddies. I do. I'm, I'm a lucky guy, but as, as do you, but well, one thing that you do a lot, you spend a lot of time now, you've got two kids mm -hmm. and, uh, I mean, Talk a little bit how you have managed, you know, to be able because I, I think you're doing a great job as a dad. I can do really, I can tell because you always ditch me to go be dad. But, <laughs> um, but what's been kind of the funnest part of, about being, you know, a separated parent, uh, a divorced parent, and then what's been the biggest struggle that you've had to deal with? Um, well, the biggest struggle for sure that comes to mind is when I got when we separated. Um, so my ex wife left. Um, Texas and moved here to Utah. Um, and that was kind of something that we had discussed. She knew that um, I was going to potentially come here and practice. And so this became kind of the best place for her to be. And it was something we agreed upon together, but it was extremely hard for me because for a year and a half, I my kids weren't there. And residency, we already talked about the hours. So basically every month I was uh, coming, I was flying here on a Friday night I would see the kids Saturday, hang out a little bit Sunday, and then I flew back Sunday afternoon or Sunday night so that I could be back for work. Um, and it was really hard. I feel like I missed like a year and a half of their life. And so this last year has been the, the best part because, I mean, I'm, I'm really happy with my practice and work and everything like that, but the best part has been coming home and being able to be with them on a regular basis. Um, and so it's really been kind of catching up and kind of, learning them again for this last year. It's been awesome. Yeah. Well, what, um, uh, what advice do you have then? Like somebody, so many people are considering the medical school, right. Or concerned with that. And, and those that really have a passion for it, like you did, they're going to do it. Um, give us a little bit of some advice that you would tell, you know, maybe somebody that's in high school or, or just starting in college that is thinking about going that route. Uh, if you want to do it, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to talk you out of it. Like, I'll tell you exactly what it is. Um, but there are so many routes to kind of help you through it today, uh, starting right off the bat in high school. Um, the other thing I'll tell you is you don't need like a science degree in order to do it. And I did my undergrad in business administration. I would say the best thing that I ever learned from my dad was he, he said, told me doctors are idiots when it comes to business. And he had tons of clients who were uh, doctors and uh, he was a financial advisor for them for years. And so I got a degree in business and I, I don't know that I'm running a practice better than the average guy, but that was one of the things that I really would tell a lot of people that are going into it is, you know, get a degree in something else that will help you do all the pre-med stuff. You're going to get all the science stuff you want, but do something else. That's also going to help you in case the medicine thing doesn't work out or also to make you a more well-rounded uh, med school candidate and just more well-rounded person in general. Mm. Get your degree in literature, do it in history, do it in something else besides science. I just think that's like the normal route for people to do is, oh, I'm just going to do biology or chemistry degree. And then when med school doesn't work out, like, there's not a lot of options. Yeah, you're teaching you're, you're yeah. teaching people biology or chemistry. <laughs> there's not a lot of options. So, I mean, if, if that's what you're passionate about, do that as well. But um that's I think that's great advice. What, you found a really great practice here in Draper. How did you how did you find that? Uh, so before I was uh, came out here, I sat down. I wrote a letter to every board certified plastic surgeon in the state of Utah. Uh, that's something we should talk about too. There's not a, there are a lot of plastic surgeons or not plastic surgeons. Or not, well, yeah. not board certified. We'll get there. Okay. So, <laughs> um, but uh, so, so I sat down. I wrote a letter and I just said, Hey, I grew up in Utah, hometown, coming home. I'm not necessarily looking for a job, but if you have something available, I would love to sit down and talk to you. By the way, is it true that Utah has more plastic surgery, surgeries and more plastic surgeons than anywhere else in the nation? More plastic surgeons per capita than anywhere else. What about the actual pr plastic surgery procedures? The numbers more? are probably different just because of um, 
because of volume and because But of there are more plastic surgeons in Utah than anywhere per else. Per capita. Okay. Yeah. yeah so, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the per capita thing. Yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, the, the density of them here is huge. Okay. Um, so, I, uh, I had sent that letter and I didn't think I was going to get any response. And within two weeks, I had 12 guys calling me up and wanting me to either join or buy their practice or come meet with them. Uh, and one of the guys that I met with was, uh, Steve Warnock, who's, uh, in my practice now. And I, I think between him and, uh, my other partner, Rick Fryer, they're probably some of the two best, more well-known plastic surgeons in the state. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, Steve and I sat down and I remember it was Sunday morning and we sat down to brunch and, uh, he brought his wife with him and we talked and he had known a little bit about me and I said, tell me about you. And he started telling me about himself. And I just, we, we just clicked. I was like, we're, we're the same person. man. <laughs> we had gone through a lot of similar, um, challenges in life, um, and had a lot of similar beliefs. And I kind of look at him as an older brother now. And so I've joined this group and the group is premier plastic surgery. So here in Draper, we have myself, Steve Warnock, Rick Fryer, uh, Dave Matoki was with us, but he just retired. Um, we're bringing on another, uh, Dr. Paul Watterson. And there are two other guys that are under this premier plastic surgery umbrella. Um, Dr. Kerr and, um, Dr. Leland and, but they don't practice in Draper, but we're all kind of under this umbrella and sure. the group works well. I mean, we're the largest cosmetic, we're the largest private practice plastic surgery group in the state. Um, and for me, it was, it was huge. I started off and I think if you're anywhere in Utah and you Google anything plastic surgery, our group comes up somewhere on the first page. And I had a lot of people in the first few months that I was here that would come in and say, how'd you find out about me? They said, well, actually I want to see the other guy, but they're <laughs> booked like three months out. So they said I could see the new guy tomorrow. Well, that's the hard part about plastic surgeons. A lot of times, right. Is you still have to now build a clientele and build mm -hmm. a business. So, um, to have the opportunity to, like you said, to be part of a group that's already established was probably a, an easy decision for you. Oh, it's been, it's been great. I mean, my, I came in here and my start, there was a practice here. There was a surgery center here. My startup cost was I had to buy a computer and I had to buy this fancy white coat. <laughs> <laughs> That was it. That's awesome. So what is the difference? Because you've talked to me about this before, the difference between a plastic surgeon and a cosmetic surgeon, because it's quite a bit different, right? Yeah. So um, plastic surgeons and board certified plastic surgeons are actually pretty rare. There's there's only about 6,000 or so board certified plastic surgeons in the country. And in order to be that, you've got to go to through a plastic surgery training program, um, whether you do it like I did for six years or whether you do it like a, a lot of guys where you do general surgery for five and then you go to a three-year fellowship in yeah. plastic surgery. And then you go through this rigorous testing program to become board certified. So I took a written exam last November after I had, uh, sorry, last October after I had graduated. And if I passed the written, which I did, then I was allowed to sit for my oral board exams, which are this November. Um, and so once I pass that this November, then I'll you know, be board certified. Wow. Um, and so it's a rigorous process, but it's something that you, that is tough to find when you're looking up a plastic surgeon because the advertising laws don't really require you to say that you're a board certified plastic surgeon. You do have to say that you're board certified, but you don't have to say what you're board certified in. So there's a lot of people that specialize so, in something completely different, absolutely. but they do plastic surgery. Absolutely. You can be a guy who went through a, a family medicine residency or an uh, OB-GYN residency, and then you just decided, you know what, I want to do some tummy tucks and some breast augmentations. You go do a weekend course in that, and then you just advertise that you're a board certified cosmetic surgeon. So when you hear somebody advertise that they're a cosmetic surgeon and not a plastic surgeon, that's kind of a red flag. The other thing that I would say that you have to do is if you're researching any plastic surgery, dig into the doctor that you're considering. Get on those, get on his website, go to where it says meet the doctor, about the doctor, and everybody will have their training there listed and you'll be able to see what this guy trained in. Mm. The other way to do it is if you're not board certified, you can't use um, the board, the American Board of Plastic Surgeons logo. And so you can look on their website. If they have the American Board of Plastic Surgeons logo on there, then you know, okay, this is a well-trained 
Well, and I think that is such an, such an important point because so many people end up doing some kind of cosmetic surgery and they're not necessarily totally pleased with it. Well, yeah, if you go to somebody that doesn't specialize in that, you're bringing a lot more risk into it. I can't tell you how many people have told me, you know, they want to redo uh, a plastic surgery that they had done because it wasn't from like the right doctor, right? And Absolutely. Then, um, how many surgeries, I mean, between from the time you started residency to now, would you say you've already done uh, in your career? Uh, so when you do the pro that process of uh, getting your oral boards, so they you have to submit a case list. Um, it's basically the, from the time you graduate in end of June to the end of March. It's a nine-month period. Every single case you do, you have to document and submit to the board as this case list. Um, you have to have 50 cases in order to, um, in order to qualify and be able to sit for your oral boards. And I think I had around 370 cases. <laughs> wow. Um, so it's, you know, good. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's been a very good place to be. There's a, a lot of plastic surgery here. Yeah. It sounds like a, oh, that's awesome. 370 in nine months. So you guys, I mean, you're staying busy. Yeah. I, well, so my practice is about, I do about 60% cosmetic, uh, and then, I take call at six different hospitals um, around the valley. So I'm on any given day, I'm usually on call at some hospital. <laughs> and those uh, bring me a lot of hand trauma, a lot of facial trauma. And People so getting get accidents and things like that. Mm -hmm. What's the hardest thing to do surgery on? What's your hardest one where you're just like, oh man. Uh, um, I, I, I do a lot of hands and I think hands are difficult because the anatomy is very difficult, but I really enjoy hand surgery. Uh, say as a cosm doing cosmetic plastic surgery, um, a, a nose job, to, which is a rhinoplasty, is mm -hmm. probably the hardest. Just walk us through, just like as an example, like a nose job. What exactly does a plastic surgeon go in and, and doing? Just for somebody, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I just I'm curious about it. So for it depends. So when the patient, you know, when a patient comes into me and they're interested in a rhinoplasty, the idea is break it down into why. You know, is it is it a breathing problem? Is it like an actual problem? Yeah, let's say I just problem? don't like my nose. Yeah, if it's just a straightforward cosmetic problem, we talk about what it is that bothers you. Is it a, a dorsal hump or a, kind of a bump on the bridge of your nose? Is your nose too wide? Is your nose too droopy? Um, those are the more common complaints I get. Yeah. Bump on the nose, too wide, it's too droopy. Um, and those are the things that we can fix. Um, I do all of my rhinoplasties as an open rhinoplasty, which means that there's a scar right across the columella here, which is this little bridge of skin separating the two uh, nostrils. And then that allows me to lift the skin of the nose all the way up so that I can expose the underlying portion of the nose, which is kind of bone up top and then cartilage down low. Uh, and then I can shave any part of the bone that's too prominent. I can remold the cartilage uh, the way that I want it to. Uh, I can put grafts in there if I need to in order to add projection to the nose or bring the tip of the nose up. And so I've just that's wild. Lots, lots <laughs> I was never going to be a doctor. I, I don't do well with blood. Like you just uh -huh. talking about folding the skin of the nose up and I'm like, I'm out. <laughs> I told you to come watch a surgery. I need to. No, I would love to. But no, that's it's fascinating. It's a really cool career and profession and it's fun to you know, I love being able to send people your way and let people know that, you know, this is, and it's one of the reasons why I love, you know, you've sponsored a few of the podcast episodes and I, I'm a big believer in plastic surgery. I've seen what it does for people's confidence, just cosmetically, as well as, you know, if it's more trauma, but that cosmetic, like if something is, you know, a little bit off or whatever, my left ear sticks to my head, right? Like I was born with that. If it bothered me a hundred percent, I would want to be able to get that fixed. So it's nice to know. I know I'm okay with it, but <laughs> But the point is, is like the idea that, you know, there's, we have the ability and surgery has come so far. I mean, if you think about the history of surgery, like during the civil war, if you got shot, they were just cutting your leg off oh, yeah. and there was no anesthetic no or anesthesia. anything. I mean, yeah. I mean, the history of surgery is one of the most fascinating histories in evolving things that, you know, I think we take for granted today, like what you can actually do with a human body versus even 50 years ago. Oh, for sure. It's, it's wild. It's changing and it's still changing. I mean, yeah. You know, face transplants are becoming more common. Is that something That's, that people actually do? Oh yeah, Have absolutely. you done any yet? Or is that something you'll be... Uh, and I was never involved in any direct face transplants in my training. Like um, on Face Off with John Travolta and the whole thing? Like, <laughs> is, that's what I'm picturing here. Like a No, there's, uh, the, the ones that have kind of happened and been successful or you, uh, in the world have been... Um, there was one that was a really bad electrical burn. Oh. Um, and then there's another uh, 
like shotgun injuries to the face and things gotcha. like that. Gotcha. There was that, uh, I saw in the news, that Mexican narco that tried to get a, a new face <laughs> and he died in the surgery. Did you hear about this? It was pretty recent. No. But anyway. Well, dude, I love you, man. It's uh, It's been fun to I watch you and it's 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 fun to see where you're at now and, and where, you know, it's kind of fun to think like who knows where the journey goes, but it's nice to have friends like you that, you know, we get to share it with. Absolutely. I appreciate it. All right, my man. 